Welcome to the Voices of Australia podcast, hosted by me, Anthea Hancox, and Lydia Tessima, where the concept and reality of social cohesion is deeply explored. This podcast is brought to you by the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute. Each fortnight, we bring to you an interesting guest who present a new and often unexplained perspective of Australia. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we are recording the podcast, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and in the spirit of reconciliation, we pay our respect to all First Nations people. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this final episode of our Voices of Australia podcast. We're delighted to have you with us, and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are listening to this podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. James O'Donnell, who's a lecturer at at Australian National University School of Demography within the College of Arts and Social Sciences. James is currently working on the School of Demography's ANU Social Cohesion Project. This project involves researchers from disciplines across the university working to measure and analyse social cohesion within neighbourhoods and communities across Australia. James is the winner of the Australian Population Association's 2014 WD Bory Rise and was awarded a PhD in demography in 2019. He was recently the author of the 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Report, which is published by the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute. And we're absolutely delighted to have him here to talk about some of those findings from the Mapping Social Cohesion survey and report. But I would also like to introduce the fact that, unfortunately, my usual co-host, Lydia Tessima, is... um, overseas and unable to join us. Um, But I'm absolutely delighted that our producer, Faisal Farah, has actually agreed to um, be my co-host for today. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Faisal. Yeah, thank you, Anthea. Thank you for having me on. Um, It's been uh, interesting being on the other side of the mic. (laughs) Nice to be on this side. (laughs) And uh, and so, James, uh, please, uh, perhaps you might start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your heritage and how you come to be here doing what you're doing. Thanks, Anthea. Thanks, Faisal. Great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, so as you say, uh, my name is James O'Donnell. Uh, I'm coming to you from Canberra, land of the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I've been in Canberra for about 15 years. I moved down to Canberra from, from Sydney um, after being educated in Sydney. My parents were both born in New Zealand and um, and and grew up in New Zealand. They moved to Australia. I was born in Australia, but then we moved back to New Zealand and, uh, and lived in New Zealand for 10 years ah. and then came back to Australia. Um, Is that where you went to school in New Zealand? I went to primary school in New Zealand and, and then we moved over and, and I did one last year of primary school in Australia and then high school and university James, in Australia. I don't detect an accent. Did you? <laughs> are you hiding it well? I, I sometimes get asked if, if, if I am from, um, often people can't quite pick it up about where I'm from, but they pick up a little a little accent sometimes. Some people are, I guess, very, very perceptive. Um, <laughs> but but I think, um, you know, in all my, and I'd be interested to hear what you guys think, but but primary school particularly is that um, that great sort of social mix. Um, and that, and that a lot of that, obviously, a, per, a lot of your personality comes from that, that great social mix in the playground, but but also how you speak and 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 your accent and that sort of thing. And that's great yeah. shaper of who we are. So I, th- I think my accent perhaps comes from doing primary school both in Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> um, you you work currently in um, well, you're pretty much surrounded by this concept of social cohesion. What what does that mean to you? It, well, that's a that's a really great question. So it's I think to me it's really about you know how, how we function as a society. It's and we have lots of different indicators that we use to measure social cohesion and lots of great measures in this mapping social cohesion survey. So things like your sense of belonging and your sense of self worth um, and your participation in society. I think when we think about social cohesion, that there's also sort of a, a sense in which it's it's also almost greater than the sum of its parts as well so so things like those indicators of of belonging um and engagement in your communities they're the important indicators but it's it's almost social cohesion is, is also almost something bigger than that too it's it as i say that goes to the our very functioning of society who we are as as a society how we connect to each other how we relate to each other sort of the peace the harmony the connectedness that ability to, to sort of manage differences and division across society that's really critical so, mm. you know, as I say, who we are as a society. As a researcher, what what kind of drew you to the topic? Because, um, you know, I'd imagine after your 
you finish your undergraduate studies and you starting to head into the world of you know research what kind of drew you to social cohesion well i can well i came at it from from a few different angles actually so I, so i started my sort of professional life working as a labor market economist but a lot of that was around um and i was working at the department of employment at the time but a lot of that is around sort of regions and about sort of that kind of regional functioning i then did a little bit of on health economics and it's last sort of 20 years in particular is there's that enormous focus on the social determinants of health and how important you know your social environment is to to good health and well-being uh, and then I was and then I worked in housing and looking at the relationship between <laughs> housing and, and well-being and connectedness in, in society so social cohesion touches on all these different aspects of society mm. to say nothing then of you know sort of politics uh, and the environment and all these other things that really impact on who we are and, and as I say, how we connect with each other as a society. Um, James, and- have, have you had any personal experiences that really um, sort of brought social cohesion to life? Any any interactions that you've had along the way that, that have highlighted this interconnectivity between labour and housing and health and all those different elements? I, I, think, I think it's as I've sort of moved around, um, so, so, so living in New Zealand, I was living in in Wellington, the, the capital, um, and that's sort of a quite a cohesive and connected city. Moving to Sydney and the suburbs of Sydney, where you know there is that kind of sense of connection and also that sense of diversity and that sense of um, that kind of vibrant vibrancy you get from this from this place that draws together people from from so many different walks of life from all over the world. Particularly, then going to um, University of Sydney, which is quite close to the you know sort of the central city, and particularly the southern part of the central city, which is just so diverse and 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 so uh, so vibrant and then in- interesting. And then coming to a city like Canberra, so it's a fast growing city. It's, it's quite a cohesive city, but it's also one that also has become a lot more diverse over the last fifteen years. So I've I've been here and just watching how. Um, how that sort of sense of connectedness has, has grown and changed over mm. time and become more inclusive as, as, as we have become a much more diverse city as well. Yeah. Now you've, you, you've been, um, you've taken on this role of being the author of um, the Mapping Social Cohesion report following on from Andrew Marcus, who of course has been talking about this for a very long time since its inception in 2007. So it's, um, it's, interesting to to hear your interpretation of what do you think are some of the key messages that came out this year and uh, and that you think we as as a broader society should actually be paying attention to yeah so so there's lots of big things emerging um, from this year's survey and and emerging obviously from over the last 15 years and and what a legacy that i've sort of come into (laughs) um particularly led led by um by andrew i think for me Social cohesion now, not only in Australia but around the world, is at this sort of really critical point where we are seeing sort of challenges, at least certainly divisions. Lots of events happening around the world. Lots of sorry, very polarized election outcomes. Lots of polarized political attitudes and ideologies, and lots of big important issues, national and global, around things like climate change. Um, and, you know, geopolitical conflict and all those sorts of things, and all these things have a bearing on on our cohesion within Australia. So we're already at this important thing, important time, and coming out of COVID nineteen pandemic, well, hopefully coming out of COVID nineteen pan- pandemic as well. And what what was really striking though in Australia is that we we experienced this this nice spike in cohesion. So we we were we had this greater sense of attachment to each other. Um, during 2020 in particular, we were more trusting of government. We felt a stronger sense of belonging. We were, um, you know, we were, I guess we were less engaged in our community just because we were under sort of lockdown orders at various stages and in various, various cities. But we were connected to our neighbours in particular. We, we were more likely to be sort of trusting with each other and, as I say, of government. Um, but that's, that's come down now, certainly over the last year and, and perhaps over the last couple of years as well. Um, and so on some indicators, we're saying we're probably where we were before the pandemic, um, but there are some positive and negative signs that serve as both opportunities and, and sort of warning signs for the future. 
Um, so we continue to be uh, have a high levels of trust in one another. We continue to have a really high level of support uh, for multiculturalism and ethnic diversity in Australia in 2022, and that's really encouraging. On the downside, we're seeing this sort of continual decline in the sense of national belonging. Um, and there's, there's probably a couple of things driving that we might talk about, but um, it's sort of been declining perhaps for a good, well, over the course of the Mapping Social Cohesion series since, since 2007, it sort of continues to decline in, in 2022 after having a little a little sort of pick up in, in, during the pandemic. Um, and we're, we're also sort of, that trust in government is declining a little bit, and that sort of sort of sense of fairness in Australian society, economic fairness in particular, is also a little bit under strain and, and sort of declining in the last year. James, um, I think those are like a really good summary of the findings. You know, for someone that's not that familiar with the survey, do you have any kind of things that they should know about? That, like, for example, how many people were surveyed? I think uh, those that might be new to the actual study. Well, were, were, how did you actually go about studying this? Yes. So we work with the um, with the Scanlon. Sorry, the Scan, well, we do work with the Scanlon Foundation <laughs> Research. We work together, uh, the <laughs> ANU and the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute. I meant to say the Social Research Centre um, to deliver the survey. So they run the survey through their Life in Australia panel. So they have around about 7,000 people. And they've contacted these people randomly, um, which is quite kind of unique in Australia at the moment. So they've randomly contacted well, thousands of people and they've got more than 7,000 people now to, that have agreed to be on their panel. And so they stay on their panel and they're interviewed at set points during the year. And they're invited to complete the survey once a year on the, on the Mapping Social Cohesion Survey. And so this year we had about... Uh, well, almost 5,800 respondents to the survey. So that makes it a big survey and the biggest survey that, that has been conducted in the Mapping Social Cohesion series. Uh, and we have, you know, more than 90 questions related to social cohesion and related attitudes, attitudes to migration and multiculturalism and diversity, um, attitudes to some of the big national and geopolitical events going on um, internationally and around the world. Um, and a whole set of uh, sort of demographic and socioeconomic indicators as well. So we can look at some of the differences in how people express their connectedness and cohesion in Australia, look at differences across groups, for example, by, you know, things like education and, and age and sex and um, so, so sort of geographic analysis as well. I think that's where we're going to probably uh, probably get into next because we're, we, we're really interested in, the kinds of factors that influences the responses, you know, 5,800 people, that's a significant number of Australians that are responding to it. Do it are there main domains that you see or ma major factors that influences how someone might respond, for example, economic or financial circumstances? How, how do you see uh, a few playing out? Mm. Well, there's a really nice piece of analysis, particularly in the 2021 report, which is still up online, and people should have a look at, especially, I think it was in one of the appendices, a really nice analysis. That actually, it was actually looking at sort of the major factors that driving uh, how individuals perceive social cohesion within themselves and, and perceive their connectedness and, and how that's actual, like, actualized through things like participation in, in organisations and voluntary activity. And what that shows is sort of the economic and financial pressures seem to be the, the biggest predictor. So people that who are saying that they are, um, dissatisfied with their finances or saying that they're uh, struggling to pay their bills or they describe themselves as poor or, or perhaps just getting along, um, they're much less likely to say that they have a strong sense of belonging in Australia, they're much less likely to say that they're happy and have that sense of self-worth um, and much less likely to trust government and less likely to believe that um, Australia is a kind of a fair place where there is that sense of economic fairness in society. Uh, and then I guess the other big one was age as well. So, so and not unrelated to, to the sort of financial pressures. So young adults in particular, so that particular 18 to 30 year old group, um, similarly, less likely to feel that strong sense of belonging in Australia, lower sense of personal worth and financial satisfaction, um, and also lower sense of so, sort of social inclusion and justice in Australia, and lower sense of trust in government. It's, it, um, I think some of the findings, James, showed that geography wasn't quite such a predictor anymore, whereas it had been in the past. Is that correct? 
well, geography is a really interesting one, right? And 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 you know, it's 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 so diverse. And and one of the things, I guess, we have a nice big sample of almost six thousand people. It, it can be still difficult to get right down into the to very local areas, mm -hmm. even, even with a big sample like that. But there's some really interesting findings coming out. So traditionally, I guess, um, regional areas, areas particularly outside the major cities, they're sort of internally quite tight-knit. So they might have a strong sense of local belonging, strong sense of sort of connection within their communities, um, but perhaps sort of lower levels of trust in government in particular, mm -hmm. and also lower um, average levels, at least, in terms of acceptance of, of sort of multiculturalism and diversity. Um, but it's, it's quite striking in this year's study, and, and perhaps over the last couple of years, is that people in outside the major cities are um, had, have had a big increase in the extent to which they think multiculturalism has been good for Australia, big increase in the extent to which they think diversity makes Australia stronger. Um, they're still reasonably distrustful of governments, <laughs> <laughs> um, and but still quite connected within within their communities as well, and they're able to mm -hmm. tie that now to diversity as well. So, so I've always thought that the neighbours um, are there to help each other uh, outside the capital cities, but also now, also more likely to believe that neighbours from different backgrounds, different ethnic and national backgrounds, are also um, get along well together. Yeah. Uh, it, it's um, th this sense of getting along together and trusting uh, and belonging is certainly one of the findings in the research, which really highlights this uh, sense of how comfortable people are within their own local neighbourhoods. Um, as you've just mentioned, that that sense of I can trust the people, my neighbours, I can uh, feel comfortable that they, the diversity is is something I'm comfortable with within my own neighbourhood area. Um, I've, I feel like I have a voice within my local area, uh, which is somewhat different to people's sense of belonging on a on a more national level. Is uh, do you want to explain that a little bit further? Yeah, sure. And so that was a really striking finding coming out of this year's survey. So high and increasing numbers of people, um, you know, have that strong sense of neighbourhood connection. So if you say, and that's across a, a couple of measures, so the extent to which they feel that neighbours help each other, they get along well with each other, the extent to which people feel a sense of belonging in their neighbourhoods, that they have that say in their community, as mm -hmm. you say, that's that's still high and really strong. Uh, so, so, you know, for example, more than 80% of people um, think that the, the neighbours are, are there to help, help when, when need be. And that increased during, during COVID-19, so that kind of... It, picked up by quite a few percentage points during 2020 um, and it's still high in 2022. Yeah. So some of the interviews we conducted, you know, could kind of bore that out as well is that people made these connections. They made connections across uh, different groups, um, particularly in quite diverse communities. They made connections across different groups and, and felt that sense of support and know that that sense of support is there for them when, when next they need help. Yeah. Um, and so, so there was that contrast between it, that strong sense of neighbourhood belonging, high and it, growing sense of neighbourhood belonging. It is really interesting, isn't it, as to um, whether or not we're all moving towards seeing ourselves as global citizens um, and the, therefore your national identity is less important now than it used to be um, or, or whether or not it's something actually to do with um, our experiences of, of federal government over the last year or so. Um, do do you have a view about whether or what you think those influences might be on people's views about um, belonging at a national level? So I think at that national level, so that has been declining over the last fifteen years, and I, and I think I think there are probably a, a couple of things coming going along. So one of the things that we found was that well, the decline in belonging was felt across society, so young and old people, um, sort of people from high and low socioeconomic mm -hmm. backgrounds, but it's particularly among the Australian-born population, particularly among young adults. Um, and particularly among people who said they were sort of financially struggling. Yeah. And so what that might indicate, and we need to do some further research on this, is that there, there probably are some sort of changing ideals and changing sort of that changing sense of how we define ourselves as either sort of national, local or global citizens. Um, and so that particularly when we think about young people and that declining sense of belonging, that might be a sort of generational change in how they identify with Australia as opposed to their communities and national level. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 it's quite a it's quite a stark drop drop in belonging um, over the last fifteen years. So so 
is this something, James, you think we should be paying more attention to that, that uh, decline in belonging, as you see as a trend to a certain extent? Is that something that, is it a, an evolution in terms of how young people are experiencing, uh, you know, the Australia, if, the, if, uh, if, you know, to use a, to, to use that phrase, like in that sort of sense, or is it something that, you know, it's, uh, it's something that you think we should be concerned about? I think so. The extent to which we can we should be concerned about it, I think, relates to sort of what's driving it and what's behind it and what sort of implications it might have. And so, if it is if it is sort of a, just sort of social and cultural changes, different ways in which we identify, perhaps we're not necessarily so concerned. That's just a part of you know sort of sort of life and and culture and changes across generations. But to the, the extent we, we which, which we might be worried about is if it does then impact on. Um, you know, people's sort of participation in society, their sort of um, their engagement in their communities. We don't necessarily see that yet um, because that connection within communities is still strong. So that's really positive. The other the other area of concern is the extent to which that decline in belonging is associated with sort of financial pressures and how financial pressures and the, the extent to which people sort of sort of financially struggling is driving a decline in belonging and particularly in 2022 when we have economic and cost of living pressures that seems to be impacting on people's belonging so that they feel a sort of sense of um sort of isolation and disconnection when you have those kind of pressures in life and we see that not just with national belonging but also at that kind of local level it has we haven't seen that manifest as a decline in sort of local belonging but even at that local level sort of financial pressures are still the strongest predictor of whether you feel connected within your within your neighbourhoods and you're within your local communities. So, so James, a, a question without notice, which is the Australian electoral study has highlighted that um, asset ownership or lack thereof has been a, sort of a, a, an indicator, if you like, of people's um, voting preferences. Do you, given your experience in housing and um, that, that intersectionality, if you like, of these different elements and people's sense of their own financial well-being, do you think asset ownership has um, is is an indicator in some way in regard to the sort of work that we do? I think I think it potentially does, and we sort of see as far as far as our, our survey goes, we can see like a sharp sort of distinction along some of these domains with sort of tenure type and and whether you do own a place and or whether you're sort of mortgaging or renting and then or feel like you can that, own one yeah yeah and, and whether you're within that with within you whether you're struggling and that can mm. play into that kind of sense of belonging especially um, yeah and that sense of sense of connection it's we certainly it's, know don't we that voting preference in and of itself has is a um a, a way of indicating where people sit on the continuum of their openness to multiculturalism and the like um, one of the things that we had always questioned was whether or not young people who appear to be somewhat more progressive, do they actually remain that way over time? So when they get into their 50s and 60s, will they also be progressive or not? And um, because older people generally tend to be more conservative and are less open to multiculturalism and the like from the surveys that we've done. But again, going back to the Australian electoral study, it highlighted that in actual fact, people are not changing their voting preferences as they get older anymore. They're, they're actually remaining where they are. So it's quite an interesting thing to think whether or not, and this is probably a rhetorical question, not necessarily a one you have to respond to, but it will be interesting to see if those young people's views that are somewhat on the the open and and quite um welcoming end of uh, social cohesion whether that continues on now and that's actually a sign of us becoming a more um hopefully um open and welcoming society going forward mm. it is an interesting point too there because there is that assumption over time that and it, like their generations change like mm -hmm. you know they they go through a cycle of political preferences, but um, I, I, I think that it is interesting for us. What what do you think the Mapping Social Cohesion Survey tells us about the connection between people's voting intentions and their perceptions on life in Australia? Is there, is there a connection there? There, there is connection, um, and and in demography, you know that that's a big issue for us. Is about um, you know whether changes in society are driven by 
sort of process of aging or, or cohort generation, cohort differences, so generational changes, saying whether people grow into different different stages of life and whether they change their alignment as they grow older. And, and so we, we see some of that in the mapping social cohesion survey. So we see, for example, um, uh, conservative voters tend to be, as you say, a little bit less accepting of multiculturalism and diversity, less accepting of, well, they're less inclined to uh, agree with the voice to parliament, for example. Um, they tend to have a average stronger levels of, of belonging and self-worth um, and stronger levels of, of that sense of social inclusion and justice. Whereas to say, I think more progressive voters are sort of more, they have a heightened sort of consciousness of, of inequalities in society. There, there were some interesting changes, not the changes over the last couple of years and that even conservative voters have become more accepting of multiculturalism and diversity. Um, and at a local level as well, they're more likely to believe that the neighbours from different backgrounds get along well together. So I tend to think on that on that sort of acceptance of different differences and that embrace of multiculturalism, I, I think that's with us now. I don't think um, young people will age into sort of a more conservative sort of anti-immigration stance. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things we picked up on in, in, in the survey is that the large proportion of people now have friends from different backgrounds and that experience and exposure to people from different backgrounds yeah. um, is a really strong sort of predictor and it helps to shape how we view diversity at a very sort of practical sort of face-to-face -face level. Um, and, we're, and we've been seeing support for multiculturalism increase quite sharply also among older people and also outside the capital cities. Um, so I think that's one of the really encouraging signs is that um, that support for multiculturalism, that's ingrained. That's not to be say that it should be taken for granted. Um, multiculturalism and the support for multiculturalism is, is an ever ongoing challenge and, and it is, is gonna be affected by you know, kind of major uh, national and global events uh, that are happening. But, but I think in terms of the, uh, the demographics of it, I, I think it's, it's pointing in really, really positive directions. James, if you could, um from the the results of this research and the and research over time um if you could change one or two things within australian society to ensure that our social cohesion uh, just continued to strengthen what what one or two things do you think you would focus on i, th I think that the big one is is those kind of social and economic inequalities um and that sense to which um trying to address that relationship between, particularly between financial struggles and social cohesion, and how we perceive our connections in society. So, um, so just just before you go on to the whatever the other things are that you'd wave a magic wand about, um, I'm just curious about this um, because what we ask is people's own perceptions of how they they their how they view their own financial circumstances as to whether or not they're struggling to pay bills or uh, feeling comfortable, that sort of thing. And that, that, um, that's very much, it's completely, it's not dependent on people being necessarily in a, in a poor area. It's very much people's perceptions of their own uh, financial opportunity, if you like. And I think that's a really important point to make that it isn't necessarily saying that everybody that says they're poor is actually living in a particularly disadvantaged area um, in some way, shape or form. So it, I think that influences um, that sense of inequality that um, you don't have to be necessarily saying that you're um, struggling to pay bills in in order to identify a gap in inequality. In actual fact, that's a broader perception. Does that make sense or did I just ramble? <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it is it, it is a perception and a subjective perception and how that relates to, you know, kind of more um, objective or um, I guess more kind of structural measures of, of disadvantage and, and struggles will vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of it is about how a person themselves uh, perceives their own situation. And then of course, we're relating that to how people then perceive, um, you know, their own sense of belonging, their own sense of yeah. trust and their own sense of, so it's all, it's, you know, there's, there's going to be some element of personality 
and personal characteristics that sort of plays into that relationship. We can also look at some of more, what we might call more objective indicators. So we also have things like education, and we do have that that sort of um, sense of the socioeconomic status of the neighbourhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the, those those things in, in combination, those sort of the objective and the subjective indicators are really powerful in combination and looking at um, neither one of them, none of neither one of whom are a perfect indicator. So, for example, even yeah. on the objective indicators, you know, take, for example, education, um, the value of education has changed over time. So so someone with a low education, um, you know, that, that's not necessarily a perfect indicator of their socioeconomic status because, you know, the, the value of a high education is probably greater now than it ever has been. Um, Does that influence the results as you have them now? I guess it is a pretty turbulent economic environment around the world. I mean, you know, you look at the UK that's looking like it's going into recession. Um, Australia is having pretty high significant, uh, significant inflation. Does that influence like in terms of, do, do you have to weight the responses considering the kind of economic circumstances we're in with the, with our understanding of social cohesion in terms of the responses we get need to uh, I said, sort of be uh, accounted for in that sort of sense? Yeah, that's right. And But that's one of the really powerful uh, value, you know, powerful features of a subjective indicator of financial stress. Some of these things you wouldn't necessarily pick up on. That particular acute level of financial stress you might experience in 2022, where it's not necessarily sort of things like, uh, you know, a crisis of un- unemployment, obviously, because unemployment's still quite low. Um, it can affect cost of living pressures are affecting everybody so it's not just Mm -hmm. you know sort of lower educated people or or anything like that or people in sort of low socioeconomic neighborhoods um and so that's that's one of the things that subjective financial well-being is actually really powerful for in in helping to us to understand that relationship between those sort of objective indicators and you know sort of contemporary financial pressures at a given point in time Um, and so that's one of the ways in which we can consider that sort of relationship and how that might be changing Mm-hmm. particularly in the, in the current environment. James, before we, uh, move, I guess, move on to talking more about where to next and looking at the big picture, I do got a question. We do get quite often asked this question about the rise in the perception of racism. And I think quite a few of our listeners will be uh, looking out for this, for us to address this. Can you clarify a bit more about um, understanding that perception of racism the rise in that figure from last year and the year before where how can we better understand this in the context yeah so, so since 2020 uh, the survey has asked people to what extent they, they perceive racism is a problem in australia and so as you say there was there's quite a big increase uh last year and this year um you know, so now around about sixty percent of people, sixty percent last year, sixty percent this year, think that um, think that racism in Australia is at least quite a big problem. One of the, one of, and and so that's quite a large problem, and that kind of signals, I think, that um, that it is a problem that 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 is worth tackling and and needs to be addressed. Um, it, it's different from actual experience of racism so it's how people perceive racism and obviously people can perceive racism in different ways not only through their own experiences but also through 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 the media and and through sort of more indirect sources than their own personal experiences and so one of the one of the kind of striking things that we found in this year's survey was that increase in the perception of racism between 2020 and 2021 a lot of that was driven by the australian born population and so the in 2020, 2020, there was quite a gap between um, people from from well overseas born populations, particularly from non English speaking backgrounds. They they perceived them they had a much higher perception of racism in Australia than than the Australian born population. In 2021 and 2022, that gap is pretty much closed. So in some sense, it's a it's a sort of a, a catching up for the Australian born population and their awareness of racism and, and the importance of dealing with it in society. So it doesn't necessarily say that, it's not necessarily to say that racism has become this much bigger problem, um, you know, between 2020 and 2021, but it, it perhaps does say that this is, this, is a, this is a problem in Australia that most people recognise now that it is a problem. And, and there's, there's probably quite high support for efforts to kind of tackle it head on. 
Well, yeah, that, well, that's exactly what we were trying to clarify because uh, it's a question that we get quite often. James, I guess uh, to move on, what are the kinds of things you think we should be looking at? You mentioned right at the top of this that uh, we are at a critical point in Australia. Maybe you can, I can ask you to kind of elaborate, um, you know, what are the things that as a country, um, you know, looking at the data set that you've actually poured over for the past couple of months, what are the things that we should uh, kind of pay attention to in 2023? Yeah, so, so that's, you know, that's a, a really big and really important question. Um, and, you know, th- changes occur quickly and they can occur slowly. Um, and so we're looking for sort of gradual changes and, and trends over time, as well as the potential for, for new threats um, to, to change things quite rapidly. Um, and, and so and so social cohesion in 2022 is a really important juncture. In truth, it's it's probably going to be at an important juncture for the next five, 10 years, um, because we do face, we're still trying to come out of this pandemic. We still face, you know, a pretty tumultuous national and global environment. And, and I dare say that we'll be still faced with a pretty tumultuous environment in 2023. And so part of part of the challenge over the next few years is going to be the way in which we can sort of hold together as as a society and, and sort of manage our differences, work through the challenges, find really great solutions to the, the you know, the personal lived challenges that we experience um, and sort of manage, manage the effects of those unavoidable sort of geopolitical sort of events and the geopolitical climate. And so we're, we're going to be focused, we're going to be looking at that trend in belonging, for example, and looking at the trends and try to understand what's driving those trends um, in, uh, next year. We're going to be looking particularly at, um, you know, that that kind of that sense of uh, social social inclusion and that sense of social justice in Australia. The extent to which people feel that the, you know, that that their happiness, um, their connectedness to society, that their sort of their financial and personal well being, kind of steadies and at least kind of, you know, stops the sort of decline over the last couple of years. Um, and really, and I guess, really get to a point where, where we can then start to build on that and actually start to to grow social cohesion. And, and there's lots of great assets in the data that we can see um, that kind of point towards well, a potentially positive future. And so, one of them being around that support for for multiculturalism and diversity. And also, you know that- you, how you mentioned that, um, I guess, understanding the a, a bit about the data set, it looks like from some of the things are accounting for a post COVID kind of reality. Like, so uh, there are some things like trust in government. I think you mentioned just right at the start that are probably going, but they're still higher than they were before, but they're probably going back to uh, a little bit down uh, compared to where it was uh, in 2020 and 2021. Do you see maybe some of those results that start to emerge in 2023, et cetera, if they, if they do go down, are we just heading into a, post covid normal do you, do you see it that way like how long will it take for us to know whether social cohesion is being threatened it's well it's a year by year prospect so each year um it, you know it's a, as i said with with multiculturalism it's it's sort of a social cohesion is the same it's this never ending project really about um in this year to year prospect in terms of that effect of covid well it looks like we've we've still got some work to do just to get through the pandemic um, but as I, as I did say at the top, we're sort of at least on our sort of quantitative measure, we're we're at a similar level in terms of our social cohesion now to what we were before the pandemic. Um, I, I I don't know if there is strictly speaking, you know, a kind of pre-pandemic normal. We did have a reasonably stable period in that sort of throughout the 2010s, and we're sort of back to that point now. Um, so, you know, and that, and that's not a bad place to be. As I said in the report, we're, we're traditionally quite a cohesive society, and and I think if it's anything, worth, um, I think it's worth pointing out, James, uh, to to the listeners that uh, social cohesion is a process. It's not you don't get to a particular social cohesion point and that's that. In actual fact, life goes on, and so social cohesion is constantly being buffered both positively and negatively. And so, really, you're never you're never going to reach a point at which the graph is just all heading in in you know a horizontal line uh it's always going to go a little bit up and a little bit down the the question is whether or not it there's there's trends and that's why it's so important to keep doing this 
each year so that we can see them. And one of those particular areas that you highlighted in um, in your presentation on this in um, uh, in our webinar was certainly that this sense of belonging is actually dropping. And we do have to, to be aware of that, not panic, um, but just be aware of the fact that it is does seem to be going down. It might not be an issue um, because there are other dynamics that maybe allow that to drop a little bit. But um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that when we do check, <laughs> check in on social cohesion each year, uh, we've got some way of understanding what those buffers have been one way or another and uh, and what maybe might affect those things. Exactly, and well said. Um, <laughs> and also and also that experience of of um, differences across Australia and making sure that that different groups across Australia, whether new Australians, young Australians, old Australians, um, those from higher and lower socioeconomic backgrounds, making sure that they are also have that that sense of of belonging and connectedness to Australian society and, and that's another area that we always have to be mindful of and we can do with much more so now mm -hmm. with these really big samples that we're able to to collect through the mapping social cohesion survey understand how, how different groups are faring in society and and making sure that there is that sort of I guess that sense of fairness that sense of equity um, and that sense of participation and engagement across all groups in society James, uh, Anthea asked you the ma the magic wand question. I want to ask you a different one. Um, what are you hopeful for about the state of social cohesion in Australia as you've uh, had the opportunity to, you know, do this report? What what makes you, uh, in some respects, uh, kind of positive about the future of Australia? Yeah, well, there, there were quite a few things, right? And so I was really encouraged by not just that, increase in support for multiculturalism you know and and i say increase in support for multiculturalism but of course the survey has such a rich battery of questions and indicators on attitudes to to um, immigration diversity the value of new australians to our economy and our society and culture and all of these things are pointing in, in an upwards direction yeah. and and at least on a good couple of these big couple of issues a lot of the increase has been driven by groups that traditionally haven't had that same level of support. So particularly older Australians, not to pick on older Australians, but to say that older Australians are now more accepting of, of and, and and embracing even of diversity and multiculturalism than ever before. Um, people from, you know, sort of non-capital city regions, um, even people from, from low socioeconomic backgrounds as well have, have experienced a strong increase. I'm loving what's happened with, with, sort of that those community connections and neighborhood trust and you know in in some ways it's not unexpected that when you go through such a sort of traumatic crisis period that we are sort of drawn together we've kind of seen that um through other events and, and through research around the world that there, there often is this sort of um galvanizing effect it's really striking and positive that it occurred amidst amidst a, a pretty tumultuous sort of global sort of geopolitical environment um, but it's also encouraging on that that measures like that sense of connection within neighbourhoods and local communities and the sense in which we trust other people. Diversity, you know, friendship groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That That's still really high in 22. So that hasn't come down. And that might be, you know, hopefully that's something we have to watch for in the next couple of years. But but hopefully that that's a kind of lasting positive legacy of how we responded to COVID, the connections that we made within our communities and knowing that there's that sense of, well, knowing that there's that connection there and that's a source of support um, and creating a, perhaps a basis for, for you know, even stronger communities in the yeah. future. I, th I think too, you know, trust in institutions is an incredibly <clears throat> important part of social cohesion. So it, it is really nice to see that even though some of the measures have dropped below pre-pandemic levels, trust in government has not. Um, even though it's dropped certainly since the pre-pandemic, during pandemic, it's, it's actually, there's still... Um, it hasn't dropped as low as perhaps one might have expected, which is a really positive thing. I think um, society is actually saying that they're reasonably comfortable with our democracy at the moment and uh, and waiting to see where that might go. I think just before we finish, though, it is worth mentioning uh, that we did ask a question about the voice to parliament and that there was a really positive um, view about the voice to parliament, uh, that it was more than 60% of people in in all the states uh, of the, around about 60 percent um, in all of the states were very positive about the voice to parliament there's still um, maybe about 20 percent that are um, 
a bit confused or don't really know what it means or whatever. So I, I think when we're talking to um, our listeners, uh, we would encourage them to uh, talk to as many people as possible about uh, what actually a voice to parliament is. Uh, so that we can start to maybe do a little bit of myth busting before um, the the, <laughs> the fully fledged campaigns get underway and help people understand how government actually works. So um, uh, thank you very much, James, for having um, been a part of this pep, uh, final podcast. We're absolutely delighted that it is an opportunity to reflect on the Mapping Social Cohesion uh, survey and report at this point in time and uh, just delighted that you've joined us, the, the Institute family. Uh, to be the author of that report. And we're just delighted to have had you as a part of this conversation. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Faisal. It's great to be with you. I love the podcast and I'm really honoured <laughs> to be a part of it now. Thanks, James. Thanks very much, James. <laughs> Well, Faisal, what an amazing series this has been. It's been absolutely wonderful for our first um, podcast, uh, Voices of Australia, to actually listen to the Voices of Australia and to understand v- so many different perspectives on what is social cohesion. It's been absolutely wonderful to enjoy so many uh, different speakers on so many different perspectives of this particular topic. And I'm actually interested in hearing a lot more of those perspectives. I would, of course, like to thank everybody that's tuned in uh, to this podcast. It has been growing uh, with every edition that we've been putting out. And that's um, a very rewarding experience to have and I would like to encourage everybody to share their feedback uh, with us but most importantly we will be back in 2023 and particularly what we would like to do is to ask you for your questions what sort of things did we not ask during this series what are the sorts of questions you have about social cohesion that you'd like to have answered what are the different perspectives that maybe we need to have our minds opened up to in order to think more about this particular topic like a teacher would say back in the day there is no stupid question so please do reach (laughs) out um i also want to take this opportunity to uh thank uh the person that's in the room with us here today which is john bigelow Bigelow. who's been a wonderful uh asset as a uh, person producing this alongside us he's been there from the start so it's been wonderful having him uh do this i also want to thank uh Lydia, who's not here today. Absolutely, who's, who's so would I. Re- a really wonderful uh, co-host. And a few other thanks, thank yous, which is to Teresa, who's helped us with a bit of the artwork for the institute, uh, for the podcast. We want to thank Official Stino for the music that you hear yep. every single time. We want to thank Jean for helping <laughs> us. She was our very first guest. I know you guys haven't heard her, <laughs> but uh, we do want to thank her, which she's been actually she really was our wonderful. Guinea pig, yeah. she? And also wonderful in supporting the podcast. So there's been many people that have been behind the scenes and helping us get to where we are today but yeah special shout out to you guys absolutely and of course i'd like to thank you Faisal, for being the producer of this podcast uh it wouldn't have happened without you or without john so and um it lydia and i think uh it's just a fabulous opportunity for us to be able to share this uh this thinking social cohesion is a topic that now has become far more mainstream than it ever was before and it's um really delightful to be able to investigate it and research it in a way that um makes it far more a part of a public conversation. I would, um, as I mentioned, uh, encourage feedback and questions uh, at info, um, info at scanlaninstitute.org.au, but you can also find us on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And please do uh, send those questions through. That's what we'd like to structure our next series about. And, uh, and I'm just delighted that I'll be able to talk to everybody in 2023. So thank you all very much. This podcast was brought to you by the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute. This podcast is produced by Faisal Farah with sound design and mixing by John Bigelow. Original music is by Official Steno. You can find all our publications on our website at scanlaninstitute.org.au. Please subscribe to be the first to receive our next fortnightly edition.